Okay, good afternoon. Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our event, Border Visions, a conversation with series editors. I'm Kristen Buckles, Editor-in-Chief at the University of Arizona Press. And the University of Arizona Press um, is the premier publisher of academic, regional, and literary works in the state of Arizona. We disseminate ideas and knowledge of lasting value that enrich understanding, inspire curiosity, and enlighten readers. We advance the University of Arizona's mission by connecting scholarship and creative expression to uh, readers worldwide. And I respect, respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Atam and the Yaqui. Founded in 1959, the University of Arizona Press is a nonprofit publisher of scholarly and regional books. We publish about 50 books annually and have more than 1,600 uh, titles in print. Situated just 70 miles north of the US-Mexico border, the University of Arizona Press has been publishing books about the people, the environment, and the history of the region since our very beginning. Our new book series, Border Visions, marks an exciting new horizon in our editorial program, and it underscores our commitment to publishing innovative scholarship about the US-Mexico borderlands. I am really pleased to now introduce the Border Vision series editors, Dr. Vanessa Fonseca Chavez and Dr. Yvette J. Saavedra. Vanessa Fonseca Chavez is an Associate Professor of English and an Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Arizona State University. She holds a PhD in Spanish Cultural Studies with an emphasis on Chicana and Chicano literature from Arizona State University. Dr. Fonseca Chavez is the author or co-editor of three books, including most recently, Colonial Legacies in Chicana and Chicano Literature and Culture, Looking Through the Kaleidoscope, published by the University of Arizona Press in 2020. Yvette Saavedra is Assistant Professor in Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Oregon. She holds a PhD in history with an emphasis in borderlands history, the US West, and gender and sexuality, from the University of Texas at El Paso. Dr. Saavedra is the author of Pasadena Before the Roses, Race, Identity, and Land Use in Southern California, 1771 to 1890, published by the University of Arizona Press. So welcome, Vanessa and Yvette, and thank you so much for taking time out of your day, of your week, um, to talk about our new series, Border Visions. Um, so if I could, I would really like to start by asking us or asking you to tell us a little bit about the series um, and what inspired you to create a book series focused on the US-Mexico borderlands. Yeah, thank you for that question, Kristen. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. We're really excited at the, uh, the number of registrations that came across and also the number of folks who um, are joining and it'll be available through Facebook Live right now. And then it's recorded, so you can also uh, check it out. I think Madi <laughs> mentioned that it will be available as of Monday on the U of A Press website. So lots of opportunities to get the information um, if you're not even if you're not with us today or you know somebody else who might uh, benefit from uh, this conversation. So um, just a little bit about the series. Um, Yvette and I both uh, publish pretty widely in borderline scholarship, and that's kind of widely defined as this dynamic region, which encompasses different historical, political, socio-cultural factors, linguistics. And uh, we were really, really excited about having a series that not only brought us back to the US-Mexico borderlands, one, because there have been generations of scholarship prior to the scholarship that we've produced that have been very influential in the ways that we have thought about the borderlands, but there's also really innovative scholarship that's returning to the US borderland, US Mexico borderlands and thinking about how can we view this differently? What kind of themes and tropes and historical markers are moving us to think uh, differently in innovative and challenging ways about that space, right? But it's not just that geographic space. We know that through Chicano literature scholarship, through Chicano historical scholarship, 
we know that it encompasses a much more kind of dynamic way of thinking, right? Ansel Dua talks about this, other scholars talk about it. So how can we think about not just the US-Mexico borderlands as a geopolitical space of critical inquiry, but really thinking about more broadly the concepts of borders and boundaries as we encounter them within uh, Chicanx scholarship, also as it relates to indigenous scholarship, to Afro-Latinx scholarship, to mestizo scholarship, so really we're, we're taking this sort of wide net and really uh, blowing out how we're thinking about this and inviting people to, um, to think about that with us through publishing with the Border Visions uh, series. Um, thank you, Vanessa, for that. That's, uh, I think, you know, you've said it all, but I, I you know, what I'll, what I'll add to it is um, that uh, I think one of the things that's really central in addition to, to what my colleague has said is, is just the passion and interest that Vanessa and I have, as well as the University of Arizona Press, the passion that we have for bringing um, more knowledge about this particular place, the US-Mexico borderlands, but also the methodologies that are in, you know, looking at it as a methodology as well. And as Chicanx scholarship and ethnic studies scholarship expands and studies in gender and sexuality expand, um, we're increasingly seeing scholars that are using these interdisciplinary borderland studies methods to in interrogate <clears throat> a variety of different topics that allow us to, to get different perspectives about, these, um, about the place and about the people uh, in these places. And so I think that was that was very much uh, an integral factor in, in deciding to to put together this and proposing this border series, um, as well as the fact that Dr. Uh, Fonseca Chavez and I, um, I think one of the key things when I said you could definitely, um, you know, express your opinion on this, but uh, most definitely, uh, I think one of the things is that Vanessa and I look at um, we look at the basically our scholarship overlaps in a lot of different ways. And it's always been interesting to us to, to see how we can look at one topic and have various perspectives on it. And if we can do that, if we have that in our own in common, uh, in our own work, then it would be really cool to see what other scholars have, um, their ideas and their approaches to, to these different variety of topics. And I think for me, that was one of the the factors that, that really moved me to, to try to establish this series or propose this series. Yeah, and, you know, I'll just add to that, that, um, you know, the exciting kind of series that have been available in the past, Yvette and I talked about the Chicana Matter series and how that was so mm -hmm. fundamental to thinking about interdisciplinary frameworks <clears throat> for doing this kind of work, right, and really elevating um, the kind of scholarship that many of us produce um, in our own work. And so we envisioned ourselves as kind of a new generation of like, she kind of matters scholars, right? And so, <laughs> and again, thinking about just the, the relationship that, that Yvette and I have, and also the relationship we have with the press, we've been really impressed by the trajectory of U of A Press over time to really center Borderlands uh, scholarship. And then of course, both of us had very positive experiences working with the press. And so, you know, the opportunity to be able to lead a series was uh, a no brainer for us really. Yeah, most definitely. And I'll just chime in in terms of the press's interest in, um, in working with the two of you. Um, you know, the press has been publishing uh, books about the border and the borderlands really since the very beginning, since our, you know, one of our first book, maybe the, the very first book, um, George Webb's Pima Remembers, which of course is a, a memoir of a um, Adam man and sort of his life. Um, and so, you know, we've had this really long history of publishing books, like starting with um, history, anthropology, cultural studies, um, um, also into sort of education and political science. And for us, um, the Border Visions is sort of this, like I think Vanessa, the sort of, you mentioned new generation, like this sort of new um, exciting opportunity to create a dedicated space for interdisciplinary um, borderland scholarship with a really sort of innovative methodology and really theory in terms of thinking of the border, not only as that geopolitical space, but you know, as a methodology. And so that felt really, I think, exciting for us. Um, and of course, um, we work very a lot in these sort of aligned, these um, fundamentally kind of aligned lists like Latinx studies and um, she connects studies. So it just felt like um, not only like a natural progression, but really like something new and exciting for us. So um, 
you know, we were just really excited about the, 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 the scope and the framing of the series. Um, and I'll just echo, you know, one thing um, about like the, the three of us working together, because I had the, the great opportunity and the experience of working with the two of you on your books. And um, the success of a series is so much about like the team behind it. And I think the three of us, um, well, at least I'll say like, I had such a great experience working with the two of you. And I think the three of us will really work together to, to champion the series and, and um, bring out these new books. Um, I'll also say just really quickly that, um, you know, at the press, the press is part of the University of Arizona Libraries, which is of course part of the university. And so part of our interest was um, like a kind of like organizational or institutional because the University of Arizona and the University of Arizona Libraries has sort of an express interest in um, supporting borderland scholarship and borderlands work. So there was also sort of a very natural organizational alignment alignment with our our parent, you know, institutions in bringing out a border series. And so of course, when you have that kind of alignment, you get sort of interest and support. So that was sort of another reason um, the press was, was really excited about the series. Um, so I'm just, I'm just um, thinking about the series and I'm wondering if you might um, talk about uh, some of the goals that you see for the series. Yeah, of course. So again, the idea is we're looking for innovative interdisciplinary scholarship. We framed it as a humanities or humanistic social sciences because we do want to leave room for folks who are doing things like oral history interpretation, um, sociology, which can sometimes kind of move into the humanities sector. And so um, it's, 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 um, it's sort of wide open. What we don't do is uh, creative writing right now. Um, it's, not, it's not yet in Eva and I's little house. That's not to say that it cannot be that. <laughs> um, but right now we really wanted to focus on um, the strengths of what Yvette and I can offer as co-editors at this point in the series. And then of course, because the series itself is innovative, we also wanna be innovative in you know, thinking about future directions for the press, for the series, but we're starting somewhere, <clears> right? <throat> So uh, we are thinking about uh, monographs and edited collections. We are open to um, texts that are published bilingually. And that's a conversation that we're open to having with, uh, with potential authors. And um, really the goals, there's goals that we have as series editors, and then there's goals that we, you know, that you all should be thinking about in terms of, again, interdisciplinary innovative methodologies. We're really looking to kind of push that envelope on how we're imagining the US-Mexico borderlands. So what is new and exciting sort of in the world of interdisciplinary uh, research? And I'll kick it over to Yvette to see if she has anything to add to that. Um, I, yeah, I, I completely agree, Vanessa. I think a, another major element of it is, um, is that uh, especially when we see the application of borderlands methodologies in such a variety of different disciplines, I think that what that does is that it explodes all the, and, and uh, pardon the puns that I use because I love puns, right? But it explodes <laughs> the boundaries that exist that frame understandings of place and process, um, understandings of identity. And so for, for one of the elements for me that is like super exciting and what I think is, is um, one, of the, one of the goals for the series is to bring in the, the queer element that, and the queer studies aspect of borderland studies that, that has really uh, taken off in the last uh, couple of, well, the last decade or so. Um, and so I think that that's a, a definitely a crucial element um, that I wanna see explored in this series. And so if that, if that speaks to your kind of work, like, you know, bring it, bring it by us. Um, that's, you know, those are the kinds of things that we're looking, we're looking for. Yeah, and we do have a list. Um, we do have a, um, a longer kind of sheet for that we can make available to everyone who reaches out and who is interested. That gives us a couple of, of topics and questions, but we'll get onto those in uh, just a moment. And I might just add, you know, um, because, uh, you know, we have a list in border studies and we also have a series. And a lot of times people will ask me like, oh, what do you get from publishing in a series, right? Like what's the benefit of publishing in a series? And I mean, I might just say like, just, I mean, this, this um, I think this talk is just really speaking to that because what you get when you publish in a series is you get additional people. And those additional people are experts. 
And those additional people are the series editors, right? And so it is um, an opportunity for authors to have that sort of additional um, editorial support going through the project. You have you know, these experts, these series editors who can be there to talk to you about the, the, the project, um, to offer support and ideas, to bounce things off of. So publishing in a series means you get sort of additional sort of uh, editorial support. But also for me, it's also like, I am also have the opportunity of working with series editors who are the experts. And so, um, you know, when we send something through peer review and I get peer reviews, I can sort of talk to the series editors about the peer reviews or, so I also get, um, you know, this additional editorial support um, for a project. Um, and then there's sort of the benefit of getting extra um, attention in terms of um, the series editors networks and sort of um, abilities to reach their networks in terms of talking about a book. So, you know, you have a press talking about a book through the normal marketing channels, but then you have like series editors using whether it's social media or just their regular networks to help get the word out about a book. So there is like additional layer of sort of enhanced visibility and working um, in a series or publishing in a series. And, you know, I think a lot of people like to be in a series because it, it, it's, it feels good to be among um, other books that are like yours, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, once a series build, it can create a certain like um, reputation or a certain sort of cachet in publishing in a series. And so then it sort of becomes like, oh, you know, like you had mentioned the Chicana Matter series in the beginning. So um, there are definitely um, really good uh, editorial benefits to publishing in a series, a little bit, you know, more visibility in publishing with a series. Um, uh, but mostly it's about getting like, you know, experts in the series editor, additional expertise to sort of help develop a book. Yeah, and I think I'll add to that, you know, I think the exciting part for us is just thinking about as two authors who have already published with the University of Arizona Press, I've talked to a number of people who are interested in the press and want to know, like, what is the set, what is the process, you know, and so I think that, you know, potential authors will also benefit from just that knowledge of what is it like to publish for the first time with the university press and what have been, mm -hmm. you know, our experiences. Um, again, we think Kristen, we think the world of Kristen and the staff at the University of Arizona Press, so we can't say enough good things about them. But, you know, people sometimes have very, you know, you know, very big questions about, you know, is this a good book proposal? You know, do you need, you know, we can offer some extra help in those areas, right? So think of us really as, a support staff that you can call on when you need to think about ideas. You don't have to have a book proposal ready. We're ready for the sort of idea stage with you to kind of talk about things and suggest directions. And so um, think about it really as a, you know, I, what after I published my first book, I was like, I don't even have a team anymore to think about a second book, right? Like we can be your team. <laughs> we can be your team as you're going through this process. Um, right. And I know sometimes it feels disorienting to even think about just sort of the gravitas of publishing with the university press, right? And so, and I think in a lot of ways, it's really nice to have, you know, a couple of folks who are on your team who are ready to, um, you know, you can reach out to, you can have discussions with and people who will advocate for your work at that level. Um, can I add to this, y'all? I think that part of it, and I, I think this is also, it fits into like what was one of the motivating factors for us in putting the book series together is that um, I, I think, and, and you know, I'll, I'll dare here speak for Vanessa as well, because I think this is part of the conversations that we had, but um, I think it's about creating a community of scholars and, and a community of, edu of, of knowledge exchange. I think that was one of the major motivating factors for us putting this um, series together and being able to have the extra input from the editors and the co-editors and the, and, and the university press, um, it provides that added support, but it's also, it, it, I, I see it as, as also contributing to this larger like community of, of like getting to know each other and working with each other and creating these the, this network of knowledge. And so um, I think that uh, that's, I, I, you know, and I'm a little biased on this, but I think that that's why this book series is going to be awesome, right? Because there's so many excellent people involved in it, and we are going to be your biggest cheerleaders. We're going to be your advocates. We're going to help you. We're going to walk you through it. And so I think that that's, that's definitely um, one of the pluses 
um, to publishing in, in, in this particular book series. <clears throat> And, you know, in pre-COVID days, um, a lot of this kind of thing would happen at conferences, right? Like, and in fact, I think we had a goal of sort of having something like this at um, like Western History Conference, for example. And so um, one of the things uh, COVID has made us do is pivot and think like creatively about different ways we can do this kind of work. And I think that's one of the, this like session that we're having now, this um, conversation mm -hmm. is sort of a solution to not being able to um, meet at conferences. But, you know, in the future, when we can do that again, like that's also a, a thing um, that we do. It's like I meet with um, authors at conferences or we meet together as a group with the series editors and have a lot of that um, great like in-person conversation and brainstorming um, at those events. And so, um, you know, the, the press, um, we go to a lot of the conferences that Vanessa and Yvette go to. And so there was sort of natural places like in-person places to sort of meet and, and talk about things. Um, so, but I can see a future where we do a bit of a hybrid thing, like something like this and also mm -hmm. um, meeting in person at places. Mm -hmm. So do y'all wanna talk about um, that like the kind, I know you've already talked about this a little bit, but the kinds of books you're looking for, like to give us some examples of topics. Um, sure. Uh, in terms of topics and the types of questions that um, we're looking for in, in, um, in particular books, um, we're, you know, it ranges a lot of different things, but including things such as um, discussions of settler colonialism, the dynamics that exist at any given moment in terms of settler colonialism, and of course the legacies of, of settler colonialism. Um, we're looking at a lot of uh, ideas about intersections of Chicanx and indigenous studies in these borderland areas, um, decolonial methodology and thought, um, how identity and place are connected to each other. Um, so essentially place making and identity, um, questions about migration, um, di diasporas. Um, we're also looking for work that uh, discusses Afro-Mexican and Afro-Latinx populations in the borderlands. Um, so there's a variety of different um, different topics that we're looking at or looking for. Um, I think one of the biggest ways that we can describe this in terms of what kinds of books and topics we're looking for, it's about possibilities, the possibilities that exist in the borderlands. Right, the different kinds of interactions and intersections that occur in this place, whether those are intersections of, of identity or actual state or, or um, interaction of power dynamics. That's the kind of thing that we're looking for. Um, I don't know, Vanessa, if you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, and I think I just wanna reiterate what Yvette said earlier about like, you know, conversations about queer studies and gender studies and sexuality studies, which again is, is sort of this big expansive kind of way of looking at things. And for me, it's really about what have we not yet explored um, or recovered in the, in the US-Mexico borderlands, but also really thinking to, again, pushing the sort of envelope of prior scholarship that has been done and thinking about what is its relevance today? Like, what are the lessons that we learn from the work that has been accomplished in this area, right? A lot of my own work does that, the legacy of, of colonialism mm -hmm. as viewed through uh, Chicanx literary and cultural production, right? And how are we, um, you know, a lot of, again, what I do is, are, are we complicit in this or are we resisting this? And what is, what is the legacy that we're kind of pushing forward from this particular moment in time, right? So, Again, we're looking at innovative scholarship, um, possibilities. I really like the word possibilities when we're thinking about this, um, thinking about the multifaceted kind of effects of whether we're thinking about systems of power, um, moving toward decolonial, you know, more kind of engaging decolonial methodologies, the intersections between different ethnic groups that have, um, you know, come together in different border or borderland spaces. Um, and how do, how do we think about things like migration and diaspora in this political moment or in this current moment, right? And so again, the idea of possibilities, um, we are super excited again about all of it. So anyone who has like a great idea that they wanna bring to the table, like we have a list of topics and questions and we've kind of gone over those, mm -hmm. but really just um, again, reinstating that that possibilities is really what we're most excited about. Right. And, and can I add also that in terms of, you know, time frame, like we're looking at because our, our uh, specializations um, range in a variety of different um, 
historical and contemporary timeframes. Like if you're working on, on material, if you're working on scholarship that looks at the, the, you know, the Spanish colonial period in the borderlands, or if you're looking at contemporary movements over social justice in the borderlands, like those are, those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. So don't limit, don't feel limited in terms of the time frame. This isn't just, it's not a series that's only for folks that do 19th or only folks that do 20th or 21st century. Like, because, again, because, um, because our specializations, uh, as well as the specializations of the folks that will be our peer reviewers, um, it, it really opens up uh, the possibilities for the kinds of works that we can, we can uh, engage through the series. Um, so I invite you again to, to, you know, to at least come into conversation with us if you have any questions about whether or not your work or your topic will fit into the series. And I would say too, if you are an author who's not necessarily interested in publishing with the series, but you love to be a reviewer for books that come through the series, like you're welcome to. Right. That would be really fantastic <laughs> to have a whole list of people who are supportive of the kind of border visions projects that might come in. Yeah, I'll under that. I second that. That's a great, great <laughs> suggestion. Um, so I love the 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 word possibilities too, and it sort of um, links to the the title of the series right? Border visions. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about what that means to you, border visions, and, and sort of how that title sort of stuck or, or came about. Um, I think that's a good question, Kristen. I think we, you know, we went back and forth when Vanessa and I were working on, on developing the proposal for the series. We went back and forth with a variety of different titles. And I think that um, just from the, from the fact that it's, we, we kind of run the word together, right? Um, but it also, it's, it's plural, right? I think um, the plural element of the word shows that we're really interested in looking at the variety of different understandings of place and identity that exist in this, in, you know, in, in the US-Mexico borderlands um, and also in, in terms of borderlands of identities. Um, the other aspect of it, I think, is it, it speaks to something that um, I think we've addressed a little bit earlier, but what, you know, and I'll, I'll reiterate that point, the, the I think it, it kind of connotes this kind of future element, like this futurity element of, of borderland studies. Um, and because uh, we are looking at it as like the next generation of, of scholarship about borderlands, I think it really brings, it drove home the point that, um, you know, we can, we can look at the past by, with new creative, innovative ways of understanding the, the present, right? And going towards a, a new future of, of borderland studies. And I think for me, that was one of the, one of the motivating factors behind naming it border, border visions. Um, plus, you know, the, the two capital, throwing a capital letter in the middle <laughs> of, a, of a word that you ran together, just kind of, it, it, it's just the right amount of, you know, challenging authority that I that I that I like so <laughs> that's, the other, that's the other element behind it <laughs> I love that so um y'all know we like to make words work right so um, <laughs> I really like the aspect of border visions because it invites the authors to be visionaries right so again along this line of we really are thinking about what is the next generation of scholarship um, I think Yvette and I are settling into the fact that we're like mid-career scholars which like has its own set of like complications, but really think like what is a visionary, what is, what is visionary about where we're going, right? And so we invite you all to be visionaries with us um, to produce the kind of scholarship that moves us into a new phase of borderlands research and uh, just really excited about all of those possibilities that might come from that. Absolutely. Um... Kristen, I, I want to ask you, what, do you, what are your thoughts on border visions? Because again, you know, this is a community. And, and so what, what were your initial I, um, thoughts about the, about border visions? The title? I love it. Yeah, the title. Yeah, I love it. Like, I think um, it's doing like, well, first of all, a title for any title, book title, series title, it has to be memorable, right? Like it has to be memorable. So it's doing the work of being memorable but it has some flair because we're moving the, the, the two words together. And that feels really fresh and futuristic and contemporary. And it has sort of like, um, it adds to the memorability of the title, I think. And so I think it allows for all sorts of possibilities. Um, when we are there, um, 
uh, for design, right? And how to present mm -hmm. that. Um, um, so yeah, I, I love it. I think it works really well for all the reasons that that the both of you uh, articulated. We're gonna put it on a rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's gonna be the the logo <laughs> yeah the fun part is there's gonna be a logo and like yeah. all kinds of branding for this series we're very excited about that as well yeah yeah and it may or may not include capes and like t-shirts and stuff so yeah you know because it's very super super hero -y to me anyway um but anyhow um what what if um Kristen if someone's interested in publishing in the series what what are the next steps? Like, what is the what does the process look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So usually, anytime, um, like the first the first thing an author does is prepare a book proposal, and you know there could be conversations with the two of you or me before that happens. But a starting point for any project is a is a book proposal because that's an opportunity for the author to really get their thoughts on paper to organize their thoughts. Um, to really think about who they want to reach the audience for the book for the book itself. So the book proposal is a really good starting point. And I think we have on our chat um, a link to our book proposal guidelines. Um, it's the conversation starter. It's really sort of allowing the book proposal allows the press and the series editors um, uh, a good understanding of what the project will be. And then sort of, it's a place to start the, the conversation about the book. So, um, you know, a book proposal is great, is a great starting point and book proposals can come directly to me. And what I'll do is um, share them with the series editors and we'll have a conversation about the book proposals that come in and figure out what the next steps from there will be. Thank you, Kristen. So yes, um, let's see. We are almost, we wanted to really leave enough uh, time for a question and answer. And so before I start, um, it looks like we have um, some questions coming into the chat. I invite everyone to um, uh, put their questions in the chat. And while we do that, I just wanted to, any last words, Yvette and, Vest, and Vanessa about the series or thoughts? Um, before we start taking questions. Yeah, I'll just say that I'm really excited about the folks that were in this room today. So I would love to like have any of your work as part of this series. Um, I'm really inspired by um, just kind of the wide range of backgrounds and, you know, levels in academia and all of that. So um, yeah, really looking forward to hearing from you all. I feel exactly the same way Vanessa does. <laughs> now, wouldn't you want to work with this team? <laughs> Come on. Yes. <laughs> you know, we you have want. a question um, <laughs> for edited volumes. Are you looking for completed chapters with submissions or proposals with an introduction? Um, so I think from a publishing um, perspective, and then Vanessa and Yvette, you can answer this too. Um, for edited volumes, it's really great to have the proposal um, that scopes out the work. And I know sometimes for edited volumes, um, you want to actually have the chapters to inform writing of the introduction. And so um, for edited volumes, um, it might be enough just to have the proposal for the book without actually a sample chapter or an introduction. Um, Vanessa, Yvette, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just say for edited volumes, I think it's important to give us um, a good sense of some of the questions might be like, are the chapters more kind of academically oriented or more general audience oriented? Is there a mix of both, right? So getting a sense even through, even if you don't have the chapter examples, you might have an abstract of each chapter um, that we can, you know, we can look through and we can kind of determine what is the scope of this, right? So that when we're writing a letter of support, we can think about like, what is the audience for this, right? Is it, um, you know, and I'll say right now, because I'm preparing an edited volume, um, but we, we've decided to send the entire manuscript, but really it's um, what is sort of the diverse range of topics that are being covered. And sometimes introductions for edited volumes can really just be an introduction to the essays, or it can present a whole sort of theoretical framework like Chicana Movidas does, for example, right? So it would be good mm -hmm. to know how you're gonna frame your introduction 
whether it's going to be just sort of a general introduction to the essays or if it's going to really present a whole theoretical underpinning. And so um, those are just some of my suggestions, um, just to give us a sense of what will be the scope of that edited volume. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have a question. Uh, can it be written in Spanish? Um, for me, I, I don't read Spanish, so I would need it in English to be able to um, evaluate it. Yvette and Vanessa? Mm -hmm. So the press has a good trajectory of publishing bilingually, and so I think almost mm -hmm. always it's a mix of Spanish and English. Now, I have a degree in Spanish. I'm, you know, I'm perfectly capable to review uh, submissions in Spanish, but I do know that we need to think about kind of the wider, the wider audience, right? So the press board will read it, uh, Kristen will read it. So as long as it's accessible, and I think at times that um, authors have advocated for, you know, one or two chapters to be in Spanish, but that's with the assumption that the authors are also going to have kind of their own copy editing person to be able to do that, right? So a lot of it is based on um, what, the, what the editorial staff is able to do at the press. Um, and mm -hmm. so some of that may fall back on you just in terms of, of editing. The benefit is that Yvette and I both speak Spanish and I'm qualified to edit essays in Spanish. And so mm -hmm. it is a benefit of, of, of going with this series as well. Yeah, I concur. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, when do you all anticipate having your first release? Spring 2023, 23, fall 2023, what kind of timeline are you working with? And when do we get to see Border Visions? Um, that's a great question. So it's a, it's a, a new series. Um, we're just now starting to have books in the pipeline. We don't have a, a firm date as to like when the book, first books will be out. Um, but, you know, I think it would be realistic to say, you know, in the next, definitely in the next year or two, we'll start seeing mm -hmm. um, Board of Visions books out. And then in terms of timeline, you know, it really varies uh, depending on the book, but our timeline at the press is usually it's about um, 12 months after we receive like a final manuscript is when we start uh, when we uh, publish the book. So of course that's after a book goes through peer review, um, final edits and we get the final manuscript and then it's a year after that. Yeah, and I'll just say that my own experience with everything being as lovely as it possibly could have been was about a three-year process from um, nervously uh, approaching Kristen at Knox in Minneapolis to, uh, to the publication of the book. And I think that uh, one of the things that I've really appreciated is just, um, again, the attention from the press um, and the setting of deadlines um, the press is really good about sitting down with you and thinking about, you know, especially those who are on the tenure track and who are really needing that first book to come out for promotion, really thinking about what is an optimal timeline for you to be able to have your book out in line with, you know, the, the production process for the press. And so that's what I really appreciated about it. Um, right. And we are uh, with a series we're hoping, I mean, the ideal is to publish two books per year with a series. Um, obviously we're at, you know, that'll happen, like Kristen said, in about a year or two as the first books are kind of going through the process. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so uh, here's a question. Uh, this is a question for the series and the U of A press more broadly. I wonder what the standard is for publishing a manuscript that includes versions of articles that have already been published. I've been thinking through some ideas um, in press and peer reviewed journals and realize over time that these articles are the foundation for my envisioned manuscript. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so for us, um, you know, I think the idea is we want new content, but it's okay if, you know, there's a chapter or two already published because um, both, you know, you're working through your ideas, but you're also sort of getting your ideas out. So those previously published chapters sort of work a bit as pre-publicity for the larger book project. Mm -hmm. um, it's helping to get your sort of your research and scholarship out there and sort of will culminate in sort of the into the, the bigger book project. So for us, it's, you know, we think like a chapter or two are fine previously published um, before the, the book is out, you know, and usually those those um, journal articles get revised. And by the time they end up in a book, they're sort of morphed into something different anyways. Um, really, they have to be in order to 
um, work into the, the cohesive whole of the book itself. So um, totally okay to do that. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's another question um, from Maria. She says, do you prefer having a book chapter or introduction with the book proposal? Additionally, what would be the timeline and process between book proposal and contract? Mm -hmm. um, so having a, um, a chapter or a proposal with uh, a chapter or an introduction with the book proposal is really great because it helps us see the style of your writing, the tone of your writing. It gives us like, you know, a lengthy uh, part of your writing to be able to evaluate um, the whole project. And so, um, so do we prefer having a chapter or an introduction? Like having an introduction is always great because you know, you get the framework. Mm -hmm. That said, you know, I do, like, I think a lot of people write their introductions last because writing the other chapter sort of informs the introduction. So, you know, if you don't have the introduction, you know, a chapter is, is great too. But that's where the proposal, like Vanessa was saying, is sort of um, is is really letting us understand what the framework is, what the introduction will be, even if you don't have that written yet. Um, yeah, and I yeah. found submitting my introduction to be really helpful. Um, the press asked that I write it, and so I did. But <laughs> I went back and wrote it. And what was good for me is because what I was struggling with the most, and I think probably a lot of first authors are, is crafting the thread that will carry your chapters. And so um, that's not necessarily created in one's dissertation, for example, right? But being able to say, right. this chapter feeds into the next, feeds into the next, feeds into the next, here are the introduction and conclusion of that that will kind of bring it all together um, allowed me to be able to solicit feedback on what I saw as a thread. And I got a lot of really good review reviewer reports about, you know, things like, hey, let's think about swapping chapter four and five. Or, you mm -hmm. know, why don't you think about a different title for this? I'm not really seeing how this chapter moves into this one. So maybe you could work on that a little bit more. So for me, it was really helpful. Um, and that's not necessarily, you'll get that a little bit if you submit the introduction at the end. But for me, it was really helpful to have that submitted at the beginning. It was good feedback. And they, and they do change. I think that's one of the key points. So if it's not, just because you submit it as part of the proposal doesn't mean that it's going to be the exact same thing. Like, because as what, what Vanessa is saying, right? Like it'll, your, your introduction most likely will change. Right, but at least at least it does give an indication of, of where you're going with your with your particular project. <clears throat> um, and so the second part to the question is, um, what would be what would the timeline be in the process between book proposal and contract? Um, one thing that we frequently do is we send the book proposal out for peer review, um, and we'll contract. Um, with strong peer reviews of a book proposal. And so um, doing that process is a great opportunity to get feedback early on, on a project that's sort of still early in development. Um, that said, um, it also, it will add time to the, the process in that the peer review process does take time. And, you know, depending on the timeline of the peer reviewers, uh, we ask them to send reviews in four weeks. Often, especially with COVID, people need extensions, um, understandably so. Um, so, you know, the timeline from submitting a proposal, peer reviewing it, you know, getting um, the series editors support um, and feedback to taking it to our publication committee for contracting, uh, for a contract acceptance, you know, might be anywhere, you know, best case three months um, to six months. It just really depends. Uh, again, um, once the proposal is out with peer reviewers, it really, we're sort of reliant on their schedules and um, their ability to, to deliver the review at a, um, in time. Yeah, and I would say too, for anyone who, again, if this is like a 10 year clock issue, that it's a good idea to have your own schedule. Because one of the 
I don't even know what to call it. One of the advantages or disadvantages of publishing your first book is that it's on your timeline. So you obviously have that larger tenure clock and that could be, you know, any number of years, depending on when, you know, when you get into position and when you're kind of, um, you know, getting used to being at, at the idea of an institution with these kind of expectations, but mm -hmm you are your own sort of timekeeper. And so the press, of course, will remind you along the way, right? You know, how's it going? You know, all those kind of things. But really, you decide at what pace you're going to do that work. Obviously, like Kristen said, there are some things that, you know, you're not going to be able to account for. So if a review takes eight weeks as opposed to four, you want to be able to kind of build a timeline that sounds ideal. And then also put in some time for, um, for variation because that will, it will change um, on things that you can't control and things that you can control. So um, I have sat down with a couple of folks um, already and kind of thought about ideal timelines for them. So we're like, let's say you have your proposal on this date, let's you know say eight weeks later, it comes back from review. And so we do that. And typically what I see is that it's about a three-year process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was my experience with the press as well. Um, I think we said I want the book out this time, and it's like I think Chris said you said this is the deadline you need to meet that, and I was like, cool, I'll do it. And so you know, I, I got it out when I needed it and when I wanted it out. So yeah, it's very much um, on your on your time on your timeline. Um, you know, one of the things that that occurs to me as as I'm you know listening to to the conversation is that we're focusing on folks that are going up for tenure. But I also want to uh, invite folks that are recently recently minted, right? PhDs, maybe trying to figure out how to uh, move towards creating a, a proposal from a dissertation, for example. Um, and that's a process in and of itself. And um, and so, of course, if if that's where you're at right now and you need a little bit of help, I you know, I'd be happy to to talk with you a little bit about how to how to do that, right? Because um, you know, you don't, the last thing you want to do is submit an unrevised dissertation, right? Um, you, but you definitely want to get some feedback on how to create, um, how to transition it from dissertation to book. And, and I'm totally willing to, to talk about that if that's, if that's where you're, you are particularly right now. So I invite you to reach out to us if that, if that um, applies to you. <clears throat> um, so could I submit a pre-published um, articles with my proposal. Could I submit? Yes, yes. Yeah. So that does happen um, where sometimes, um, you know, there's, you have the proposal and you want to submit a sample chapter, but you don't have one written, but you have an article written. So I will occasionally get a proposal that has a, um, uh, the, the journal article with it as sort of that sample. Um, knowing that that journal article will become part of the book project. So, so the answer is yes. Could I submit a pre-published article with my proposal? Yes, I I will accept that. Is is that okay, Yvette and Vanessa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I can ask the next one. Um, so Brett says this is going to be a great series. Thank you. Uh, to what extent do you want the book to engage with the border slash borderlands as an analytical anchor for the whole project? And then the second part, would a book that examines topics in the border region, but that does not grapple significantly with the lens of borderlands be suitable for this series? I'm like, you wanna take that? Uh, I could tell you my first step. That's why I asked my the question. First. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> See, Shoot teamwork, <laughs> teamwork. This is how this works. Um, well, I, I think that that would be something that, um, we would really need to to talk with the author about to see exactly what it is that that they're doing in the work. Um, so it's it's not definitely a no, and it's not definitely a yes. It's one of those things where it, just with anything else, like we would talk a little bit more about it to get the specifics of what the project entails, um, and then we could make the decision as to whether it's suitable for for the series. Um, but you know, just because it may not be suitable for the series doesn't mean that it's not something that the press would be interested. Um, on its own outside of the series, right, Kristen? So at this point, we can, we can, you know, if, if something like that happens, it's like, hey, Kristen, we got this great project, you want to take a look at it, right? So this is the kind of, uh, again, another of the benefits that you get from publishing and reaching out to the series. If just because it doesn't fit with us doesn't mean that it won't fit with the larger press. Yes, that's a great answer. Absolutely. 
Um, from Francisca, what about independent scholars or scholars who are not um, university faculty? Totally welcome. Yes. So I did. We did realize about you know during this conversation that we have been not including that that segment of of potential authors. But yes, potential potential authors of any wherever you're at, um, as long as you you know are excited about the series and you want to have those conversations, um, we'd be more than happy to have them with you. So. Ditto to that, yay, Francisca. <laughs> Let's see. I'm scrolling through. I think we've answered the questions that have come in so far. Oh, one more. It looks like. So from Diana Riviera via Facebook Live, what is the best approach to begin a conversation about an idea? So um, feel free to contact us. So what we have done is on the website, your first point of contact is Kristen as the editor, and then she will sort of serve as operator to, uh, to funnel us questions. Um, some of you already know us, so feel free to reach out. Um, we're not publishing our, our university emails widely, but they're easily, you can easily find them if you need them. So feel free mm -hmm. to reach out and start the conversation. Um, I think first and foremost, um, if you have an idea, we'd love to hear about it. And then, you know, if the question is, this is a good fit for the series, you know, we can have that conversation. And then after that, like Yvette said, if it's not a good fit for the series, is it a good fit for, for the press, right? And I think that that's an exciting opportunity as well, just given the wide range of scholarship that, that the press publishes and creative works as well. So the press does mm -hmm. publish creative work. The yeah. series right now is not publishing creative work in, that, <laughs> in the same way. So again, there's still opportunities. <clears throat> Yeah, the first place to start, just bring the idea. That's the first, that's the mm -hmm. best place to start. And I think um, I'll go ahead and put my email address. I think we have that in the chat too, but it's uh, kbuckles at uapress.arizona.edu. Um, so here's a question from Sylvia. Are there any opportunities to approach something hybrid for the series in regards to Borderlands digital humanities, for, for instance? Yeah, Sylvia, I think that's a really good example of the, the innovation, vision, possibilities kind of scope of this series is that um, there, there are a lot of folks doing really great digital humanities scholarship, mm -hmm. and we would love for that to find a place in the series. So the answer is yes. We're about exploding boundaries, guys. Y'all. <laughs> Y'all. Y'all. <laughs> well, this has been a, a great conversation. Um, any other, please, if you have any other questions, we have a few minutes. Otherwise, any last thoughts, Yvette and Vanessa? I have no words right now. That's surprising. Um, no, I think, uh, again, really excited. I'm like fangirling on even the list of participants in this conversation today. So really excited to talk to you all and really like just to, again, reiterate and reinstate that like we're here for you. Um, we are really excited to do this work together. We think that the three of us, along with the entire U of A press team, makes a really good team together. And so uh, we want to be able to advocate um, and get your good work out there. So please don't hesitate to reach out. We're not scary people, as you have seen. Um, and we really want to kind of demystify that whole idea of like, it's scary to publish a mm -hmm. book with a university press, right? Because there are good people who are really want to be, who really want to be champions for your work. So looking mm -hmm. forward to it. Absolutely. If you're, if you're nervous about the process, what better way to get through those nerves than to have an awesome team like ours on your side to walk you through it? Well, I just want to say um, thank you so much, Yvette and Vanessa, for um, spending time with us to uh, talk about the series. Um, I will say on behalf of the press and my colleagues, we're very excited about the series. Um, we can't wait we're, to work with you on it. Um, just thank you again for spending time today and um, talking to this wonderful group of people. Thank you all um, in the audience so much for joining us this, this Friday afternoon. Um, it's been a really great conversation. It's been a real honor to, to be here. 
Um, I wanna thank um, Madi Herreras in um, U of A Press Marketing for helping us put this together and the whole marketing team. And um, again, thanks everyone. Thank you. All right, bye everyone. Thank you. Bye.